Okay, so let's take a look at the various shapes and arrangements that you'll find bacterial cells in. The vast majority of, woo, uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, bacterial cells are going to be either little dots or little rods. Let us try this again. Right. Uh, little dots are little rods. The little dots are called coxy, and they're usually spiritual, uh, spherical. And the rods are called bacilli. Now, those aren't the only forms that uh, bacteria can come in. They're just the most common. So, here are some of the other forms that you'll find in it. First off, spirillium. Spirillium, you're usually going to find as, uh, it, it'll be kind of a gentle wave sort of shape. And uh, not always, but often with spirillium, you'll find flagella coming off of both ends like that. Um, spirillium are all pretty much going to be gram negative. Uh, you also can get a uh, spirochette, which is very easily confused with spirillium and are mm, fairly closely related. Uh, spirochettes are wound much tighter and are shaped more like a corkscrew in what's called a helical shape. And uh, while they do have flagella, uh, the, their flagella are going to be tucked back in into the periplasmic space, so they're not visible. And when the flagella move, it kind of causes the the corkscrew to turn and when the corkscrew turns it sort of screws itself through the water and that's how they move. Vibrio are this is actually not an awesome picture of a Vibrio. It kind of depends on what angle you're viewing it at. This is picture is, is sort of uh, uh, viewed from a side. I usually think of Vibrio as looking a little bit more like that. Um, but uh, they're often described as being comma-shaped or V-shaped. Uh, they're bent rods. And so I usually think, you know, this little V-shape V for Vibrio. Now that's good enough for me. Um, but like I said, it, it, a lot of it depends on what angle you're seeing them at. Because you're going to be seeing a two-dimensional projection of whichever angle it is. Then we have Coxobacillus, which I find to be very annoying. Uh, because they, depending upon where in their life cycle they are, they can either look like a kind of elongated ovoid coxy or a very short rod, um, which means that they can sort of mimic both coxy and bacillus, hence the name coxobacillus, and that can confuse you. Um, if you see a population of of all the same bacteria and like they kind of range between things that look like sort of elongated circles to really short rods, um, then you're probably looking at a coxobacillus. And last, we have pleomorphic bacteria. This is kind of a catch-all category. Uh, pleo means many, morphic means shape. Um, these can be bacteria that have like irregular shapes, um, just like non-standard weird shapes, or also bacteria that can change their shape 
over the course of their life. Uh, either of those would be considered pleomorphic. Now, the arrangements of cocci. This is, is when you have more than one bacteria, how do they hook together? So there's a couple of options here. Uh, probably the first is just a single. There are some bacteria, not many cocci, but some bacteria that just hang around as a single cell, and then whenever they die, they, or whenever they divide, they split into two cells. Good, cool, no problem. And those two cells just go off and do whatever things. You could have some that when they divide, you end up with two cells, but they stay stuck together. And then when they divide a second time, you just get another group of two cells. that floats off somewhere else, and this is called a diplococci. And so here you can see, it's not perfect. Note that they aren't all, like here you only see one, here you can see like four. But by and large, most of what you see, that's a pair, that's a pair, 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 pair. Those are diplococci. Next, if the plane of division stays the same, that means that these two divide along that line, and that produces four in a row, and then all four of those divide along the same line, and that produces eight. And so on. Then what you end up with is a chain, or at least what I'm going to call a chain. Um, some people refer to it as a streptococci, uh, that is the technical term for the arrangement, but uh, there is a genus of bacteria called streptococci as well. And not all streptococci in the genus are streptococci in their form. Uh, some of them are diplococci. And then there are also some bacteria that are streptococci in their form, but they're not in the streptococci genius. I, I, I don't like it. I, I just would rather avoid that confusion, and I'm just going to call this a chain. Here you can see a chain of cocci. All right, next, what if instead of, so you've got your, your basic diplo, and instead of dividing the same way it did before, the plane of division goes 90 degrees, you end up with a packet of four cells called a tetrad. And so here you can see tetrads. Now, if the tetrads have their plane of division rotate 90 degrees again, and they're going to divide up and down now, you end up with a cube of eight, and that's called a sarcini. Uh, and there are some bacteria that are commonly found in that sarcini, and uh, that can be, they, I mean, since you're only going to see it from one direction, they'll often look kind of like tetrads, but you'll also sometimes be able to see the ones behind peeking through, like you do here. The last coxal uh, arrangement is a cluster. With a cluster, the plane of division just rotates a random amount each time. So you start off with a diplococci, and then maybe there's a plane there and a plane there. And so that goes like this. And then maybe this plane's like that, this is like that, like that, like that, and you end up with I mean it looks like that, and so on. Um and so I call these clusters. Um and that's 
what you'll hear me refer to them as. Now, again, the, the technical term for it is a staphylococci, but there's a genus of bacteria called staphylococcus, and I don't want to get the two terms confused. So I will tend to call these clusters, and they look kind of like a bundle of grapes, right? They could cluster to any particular shape, but they're often going to be kind of like big on one end and taper down into a narrow bit, just because that's the way things tend to work out. Uh, arrangements are very useful when you're talking about coxy, because most species of coxy have a specific arrangement that they do, and they stick to it. They're, like, found as diplococci, or they're found as chains, or they're found reliably as tetrads, or something like that. And they don't switch it up all that much. With bacilli... Arrangements are a little bit less useful because many of us, first off, because most bacilli are just singles, right? As the most common arrangement for bacilli is just being by itself, which isn't all that useful. Um, but even when you do have uh, or, uh, multiple arrangements of bacilli, um, species aren't quite as prone to stick to just one, and you'll sometimes find a, you know, couple of different arrangements in the same species, so it's not as useful for identification purposes all the time. There are some species that do have very distinctive forms to them. So that's a single bacillus that you see right here, right? You can also have diplobacilli, where you tend to find two of them, uh, linked end to end. And streptobacilli, where you have long chains of bacilli. Uh, again, linked end to end. And I don't have any problem calling these streptobacilli because, uh, as far as I know, there is no streptobacillus genus for it to get confused with. You can also have palisades. Uh, a palisade is a term for uh, a, a defensive wall in, like, a castle. And so when you have the rods lined up side by side, those are called palisades um, because they're kind of stacked like bricks. And you can have them V-shaped. This is a variant on the diplobacilli where they're, they tend to be connected at an angle rather than relatively straight. Uh, and obviously, like, if you have things that are diplobacilli, you can see here that often they're going to be connected at an angle, but usually not a very tight angle like this. So what about when you get more bacteria than just like a few dozen together? When the bacteria start to live as colonial organisms, and this is a thing that can happen. Um, bacteria are always considered to be unicellular. None of them are considered to be true multicellular organisms, but bacteria do form, or can form, some of them can form, multicellular associations. And I'm not just talking about a bunch of bacteria all living together. I'm talking about where they live all together and they start to have um, uh, they start to have specialized functions kind of like you might sort of find in a multicellular organism. Where, like, you know, you've got nerve cells and muscle cells and liver cells and skin cells, and those are all your cells. They're all genetically identical, but they all do different things that help you as an organism live. Uh, bacteria can sometimes form associations where different members of the group will start adopting specialized functions where their purpose is to serve the group 
rather than necessarily to promote their own survival. And since in these associations, all of the members are genetically identical because they all come from the same progenitor bacteria, and so they're all clones of each other, that means that even if you die, if another one of them lives, it's going to be carrying on your genetic code. Now, in order to get a biofilm to form, you need to really have a couple of different things. Uh, first off, you need to have bacteria that have uh, some sort of glycocalyx. Uh, slime layers are uh, pretty common. Capsules will sometimes work as well. Um, and uh, you also need to have a surface that the bacteria can attach to. And you need to have some sort of current, right? Water or some liquid moving directionally over that surface. Uh, so if you've ever been to like a river or something like that and you're playing around in the river and the rocks, like you step on the rocks and they feel all slimy and slippery, that's because there are biofilm forming bacteria that are living in that river and on the rocks. So what happens is um, you get uh, some bacteria that are just floating around and living, and a few of them will land on a surface and stick to it. Uh, once the bacteria have stuck to the surface, they reproduce and start building up their numbers. Now, at this point, they're all doing their own thing. Um, but they're all sharing this glycocalyx, right? All of their capsules or slime layers or whatever kind of meld together. And uh, bacteria have an ability called quorum sensing. That means that the bacteria make special molecules, and they make them at a specific rate. The more bacteria there are, the more these signal molecules build up over time. So they can kind of get a rough estimate of how big their colony is. And once the size of the, the, the colony gets over a certain amount, they switch lifestyles. And they begin to grow as a biofilm where they start forming this big, tall pillar. And uh, different parts of the bacteria will do different things. So these bacteria that are on the outside edge will kind of harden up, uh, slow down their growth, and they become kind of like the armor that's going to protect the bacteria underneath. Um, because they become metabolically very slow and they're not trying to reproduce, they are resistant to most antibiotics, most toxins, and um, because they all kind of gather together and, and tighten up ranks, they become resistant to much of the immune system. Uh, the bacteria down towards the bottom will form channels that actually take nutrients and funnel those nutrients up to the core of the bacteria where you have the reproducing bacteria and the ones that are in the middle, in the safest part, you're going to channel all the nutrients to and those are going to be the ones that reproduce. So these ones on the outside, they're like never going to reproduce. Um, they're there just for protection. But since they are genetically identical to these ones on the inside that are reproducing, they're cool with that. They're helping their relatives to survive. When this pillar gets to be big enough, um, a piece of it can break off. So, you got this pillar of cells here. And a piece breaks off. 
and is carried by the current downstream where it lands and eventually grows into another biofilm pillar. And that's how they spread. Uh, in some circumstances, uh, they can even like grow in multi-species formations. Uh, this is something that you can find often in um, in like soils uh, and in some rivers where you actually have bacteria that grow in multi-species communities where often, you know, some bacteria will live on the things that the other bacteria make. Uh, biofilms are very important environmentally, uh, but medically they're also important because bacteria that can form biofilms uh, are more virulent than bacteria that cannot. And there are several different diseases, particularly UTIs, where uh, bacteria grow in a biofilm formation and growing in that biofilm makes them uh, resistant to the immune system, resistant to antibiotics, resistant to phagocytosis, and so they become much more difficult uh, for the body to get rid of. All right, so that is prokaryotic shapes and arrangements.